Well, hi everyone, this is Dave. Uh, thanks for attending the session. Um, and I'd also like to say thank you to Dr. Pikalik, my capstone advisor, for all of his guidance throughout this process. So here I am about two years ago, uh, while hiking near the Vancouver Island Marmot uh, Recovery Foundation Center on Mount Washington. This is when I first learned about Canada's most endangered mammal. We've got three areas to cover today. Uh, one, uh, new developments in augmented reality offer promise for cartographers in tackling hard to communicate geospatial information. Climate change is rapidly threatening biodiversity as it modifies Earth's ecosystems. Scientists, of course, understand this well, but uh, communicating to the public in ways that they care about and understand remains a significant challenge. And the Vancouver Island Marmot and its shrinking habitat presents an excellent case study for demonstrating new techniques. Uh, so we'll just do a bit of small introduction on these three areas, and then I'll show you how I built the augmented reality experience. So the first thing to say is that augmented reality is not virtual reality. Um, virtual reality replaces the real world. These folks could be sitting anywhere and they may have no awareness of what's going on around them in the real world. Augmented reality, on the other hand, combines real and virtual objects. Um, it's interactive, rendered in real time and registered in three dimensions. So it's worth mentioning the AR sandbox. Uh, as you can see, it's very tactile and engaging. Um, I'd love to play with one, um, but it's stationary. So um, you, people need to travel to a location where one has been built and is being maintained, and that could be expensive. Uh, modern AR is mobile. So even before Apple and Pixar introduced the open standard USDZ format that we'll be working with uh, in 2018, we had apps like Pokemon Go. Uh, so a popular smartphone game here, you can go out in the park and capture all the little monsters. And we've got apps now like Ikea Place. Um, so you can choose a, a piece of furniture and then using augmented reality, um, display it in your physical space where you are right now and uh, try to imagine what I like how this chair looks in my living room, right? So if we can use uh, augmented reality to play games and to go shopping, perhaps we could also use it uh, for other purposes like communicating climate change. Uh, Lorenzoni and Langford uh, break uh, members of the public into four groups when it comes to their attitudes towards climate change. And they've also shown that visualization can help move someone from one group to another, or even within a, a single group, they could move someone perhaps from belief towards action. And Nicholson Cole has created a, a set of five guidelines for successful climate change visualizations. Um, they need to be easy to relate to, scientifically certain, uh, so that you get that element of trust with your audience. Um, they also need to be instructive with the clear message that climate change is important. Um, and it certainly helps if uh, uh, it's attention grabbing and tailored to the target audience. Which brings us to the Vancouver Island Marmot. So um, besides being super cute, our marmot is endemic to Vancouver Island, British Columbia, and uh, it's become somewhat of a conservation symbol in the region. In the year 2004, there were fewer than 30 in the wild. Uh, captive breeding and release program has brought uh, the wild population up to about 200, um, yet the potential habitat for the marmot is shrinking due to climate change. Uh, in 2018, Larissa Thielen and a few other researchers at Vancouver Island University um, released their research where they calculated all of the current uh, potential habitat area for the marmot. And you can see that in red here on the map they produced. And then uh, using climate change data for a scenario out to the year 2080, uh, they calculated that again and show a 97% reduction in area. So again, uh, here, here's what we've got right now. And you can see most of that red disappear in the future. Um, so while these static maps are striking, certainly, um, viewing the changing habitat and augmented reality can really illuminate what's going on. So my research objective was to use the Vancouver Island Marmot to demonstrate how augmented reality, GIS, and best practices of science communication can improve visualizations of climate change impacts. And so I'd like to walk you through how I went about building that. Uh, for this work, I mostly used free and open source tools on a Mac, but perhaps you could uh, work in another platform. And we're going to start out here in QGIS, um, where I've loaded in a large digital elevation model. I then created a polygon to use as a clipping mask, uh, which will be the extent of our 3D model. And we're going to export that as a GeoTIFF uh, with the same target coordinate reference system that we'll use for all of the files. Our next step is to uh, also save a single GeoTIFF uh, with our map that's going to drape over the 3D model. 
Um, and so you can see here, I'm using some satellite imagery as a base map, and I've got my feature layers of the habitat uh, over top with some transparency. Um, so thank you so much to Larissa for sharing her data. Uh, you can see in the striped uh, red here, this is all of the current habitat, which is projected to be lost. And then that little bit of bright green is what will remain by the year 2080. Um, I've bumped the resolution up to 900 DPI for this export. And uh, this is a balancing act between file size and detail. So I'm gonna clip uh, that resulting TIFF again, just to trim off the corners. And now we've got two uh, GeoTIFFs uh, remaining. So we've got our map here and we have uh, the, DM, the DEM. And so now we're gonna move into Blender, which is a popular free and open source uh, 3D modeling software. And key to making everything work, at least uh, for someone like me, who's new to working with geospatial information in three dimensions, um, is the Blender GIS plugin. So our first step in Blender uh, is to use that plugin to import the DEM uh, as a raw data build. And um, that's going to create our 3D mesh. We've gotta be careful to choose the right CRS here. And uh, this is what we get. So you can see a little bit of banding here, um, but that's all right. We can, uh, that could be due to the resolution of our DEM or other factors. And we can take care of that with a smooth modifier. Um, it's also at this point where you could introduce a decimate modifier to remove some of the points in the mesh. This model has over a million points on it and uh, removing some of those could uh, yield a, a great file savings, file size savings. So now that the mesh is ready to go, let's import our map geo raster on top of that mesh. And that's what we get. So uh, our last step in Blender now is to reduce the scale of the model a little bit. I've done that on the right here. And um, uh, we're doing this to create a more manageable uh, size for the model when we work with it in the real world uh, using AR. And we're gonna do some more scaling later. So now we export um, using the universal scene description file type, um, which then uh, we take that resulting file and open it in Xcode. Uh, as you can see here, uh, um, at first glance, it looks like we've lost our map, um, but that's okay. We have one more step left um, to optimize that map geo tiff. Um, and then we're gonna bring it back into Xcode. So open up that GeoTIFF in Photoshop or use GDAL or any other software capable of working with the TIFF. And what we're going for here is to save that using some JPEG compression. I was unable to get a JPEG compressed TIFF to open properly in the Blender GIS plugin. Um, so that's why we're doing it later here at this step. Uh, and it'll come back into Xcode just fine. So we're going for file savings here. Uh, I'm gonna take my model all the way down from 330 megabytes on this uh, material file for, uh, down to 13. So 330 to 13, good savings there. Uh, still with good detail. Uh, we're gonna jump back to Xcode, select the model and flip over to the material inspector on the right side. And you can see I'm dragging in that newly compressed TIFF file onto the diffuse setting. And now we've got our optimized map uh, back on the model. There's a bit of a shine or a reflection on there. So I'm gonna increase the roughness all the way up to one and that takes care of that. We've got much better clarity now. And uh, last step in Xcode, uh, I'm going to again, reduce the scale of the model and export using the universal scene description mobile setting, uh, which generates a USDZ file, which can be opened on mobile devices. So we're ready, here we go. You can see I've got the the model uh, open here on my kitchen table. And uh, as I walk over with my iPhone, you can see we're looking at Victoria Peak. That's a text label I added in Blender. Um, and this is uh, Vancouver Island's uh, third highest peak. And you can see all this uh, habitat area which the marmots are losing. So what's going on? What is this illustrating? Um, and uh, under a warming climate, scientists are predicting that trees will continue marching upwards uh, in elevation. Um, and our marmots have very specific habitat requirements. In fact, they, they only live in alpine meadows. And so as the trees come up, um, they're losing all of their lower elevation. They need those meadows uh, for forage, for their food, as well as um, for, to be able to dig uh, their burrows. And so they're losing all the lower bits of their, uh, their habitat range. And there's nowhere for them to go up in elevation because as you can see at this peak, uh, everything above their current range is uh, rock and ice, there's nowhere for them to dig. And so we're gonna see this phenomenon play out uh, over our larger area in our next video. And so now I've moved over to an iPad and, and I'm displaying 
uh, uh, what it looks like here to open this model from a website. So um, I've got a preview image of the model and then iOS has overlaid this icon at the top right of that preview image. And when I tap on that, that's gonna start the process to open the file. Now this is a much larger model than I would normally share across the web. Um, and I'm also opening it on an older iPad. So it's gonna take a few seconds to get going. And uh, oh, hello kitty. Um, and so here we go, the model's loading up and uh, uh, it, it's uh, kind of jittery. Um, I'm gonna shrink that down and walk around here. This older iPad doesn't have some of the newer depth sensing hardware on it. Um, and so, uh, so it's moving around, but we can still get the idea here. Um, we've got this same phenomenon playing out all across this mountain range here. So the marmots losing all the lower parts of their uh, habitat and nowhere to go up in elevation because of that rock and ice. So we have one other way that we can view this model on our mobile device, um, and that is the object view. So this is no longer augmented reality, but um, just a viewing of the 3D model. And I can manipulate that with my fingers there, pinch and zoom and, uh, and, and spin it around. And um, so again, you can see uh, the model this way a little more smoothly sometimes than in the augmented reality view, especially on older hardware. So very briefly, a few challenges. Of course, I've mentioned some device issues with older hardware and cross-platform cross issues. So um, as of yet, Google is not supporting the open standard USDZ file on Android devices. There's plenty of augmented reality features on Android, but uh, not using this standard yet. Um, and of course we have bandwidth and memory constraints for sharing these files across the web and opening them on old devices. Uh, future opportunities, hopefully wider availability and standardization of the technology. Um, but animation, we can actually do that right now. Um, if you have uh, some more advanced Blender skills, uh, you can animate your model, perhaps um, animate your feature layers to show change over time. And also just released a few weeks ago uh, in iOS 14 is a new feature called Location Anchors. So if you're an app developer, you can anchor an augmented reality experience um, to a real location in the physical world, uh, coordinates and, and uh, elevation. So you can imagine we, we don't um, need a base map anymore. The mountain can be the base map and someone's standing there with their phone looking at the mountain. Um, you just drop your, your layers, uh, your feature layers on top of that mountain. That would be amazing. And I look forward to seeing things like that soon. Uh, all of these credits and references are going to be available on the website where you can, oh yes, hello. Um, where you can go to uh, try this out yourself. And uh, that is marmots.davemaps.com. You can try the augmented reality maps. Um, you can find the step-by-step -step instructions for building them as well as the references and my contact information. Um, so I thank you for attending the session and I'm gonna stick around if we've got a minute or two for questions. Um, so I thank you for attending the session and I'm gonna stick around if we've got a minute or two for questions. Live. Well, I am officially blown away. I never thought I'd ever be able to stand in the presence of somebody who can make augmented reality. That was awesome. So, um, yeah. Wow. Um, I, we do have a few questions in the chat. Um, we have you know, a, few, a little bit of time to get to them. Um, Nick, Lally, Nick Lally is asking, uh, did, you know, did anyone catch the file format that was exported for the Xcode? Yeah, what file format was that? Yeah, it is a USDZ. It's a USDZ file. So it's a universal scene description file that's been um, specifically built for mobile. Um, it's an uncompressed format. Um, oh. So it performs better on mobile devices, but uh, the, at, at the expense of um, file sizes, unfortunately. 